Right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and possibly good evening, everyone. Uh, we are here today on uh, another session, actually on the on a, on a new session of the second day of the annual meeting of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action on um, preventing child labor specifically. My name is Elena Giannini and I'm the learning and development focal point at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. And I'm joined here today by Catherine, who's our producer and by a group of uh, colleagues from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, specifically, we have Vandana Kandari and Umi Daniel from India, working on a UNICEF-funded project. Then we have Philip Wilkinson, Cecile Fanton Danton, and Stefano Battain. Um, and uh, we also have Mike um, Kira Kostian and Sarah Gazarian uh, from Lebanon. I'm very happy to be here with all of the presenters today. You can read more about their backgrounds and profile in the chat as Catherine will be sharing uh, their, um, their profile and a little bit like of like their professional uh, history. So you get to know them a little bit more. Feel free to introduce yourself like in the chat like today. We are also keen to know uh, more of like whom is present like in this session. And um, as we go along, I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you do have questions, just drop them in the chat and we'll hopefully have some bit of time to answer some of them at the end of um, the uh, introductions of these initiatives uh, at, towards the end of the session. Wonderful. We are going to be starting with the um, initiative from uh, India and uh, Vandana uh, Kandari will have the floor in a minute and she's going to be talking us through the, uh, an initiative on preventing child labor uh, and unsafe migration uh, and highlight their experience in India. Vandana, the floor is yours. Sorry, I had a connectivity problem. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Perfectly, yeah, Vandana. <laughs> Don't worry. And if you cannot be on video because of your bandwidth, that's not a problem at all. Um, just uh, let's get you started. All right, so I will start because then I will not use the video. I'm worried about the, the bandwidth. So good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, India has been facing the whole issue of the pandemic, as you are all aware. Child labor continues to exact a heavy toll on millions of children around the world, stealing their future and often leaving them with significant physical and psychological scars. The COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic and uh, labor market shock continues to further exacerbate the already fragile situation. The gains made in India on the prevention of child labor are being threatened. What began as a health crisis has taken the form of a full-fledged humanitarian and socio-economic crisis and an even greater crisis for children. In India, however, although we see a prevalence of child labor declining on an average, this progress has been uneven. As for the census 2011, India has more than 10 million children in the age group of five to 14 years in labor, which is 4% of the total population. Post COVID-19, this number is likely to increase as 286 million students from pre-primary to upper secondary schools since March 2020 have been affected by school closure and approximately 429 million adult workers in the unorganized sectors adversely impacted economically by lockdowns and other containment measures. UNICEF's approach in addressing these situations is working with the government and other stakeholders to establish effective child protection structures and mechanisms to prevent and respond to the economic exploitation of children and children on the move. Our approach is multidimensional, as is the whole issue of child labor. It cannot be dealt with in isolation. This has a strong focus on prevention by strengthening community-based mechanisms, awareness generation, and social behavior change communication. We have been implementing models of community prevention and safe migration in collaboration with local self-government structures, women's self-help groups, 
child protection committees, frontline service providers, and child helpline and outreach, as well as railway protection forces that play a significant role. We use a mix of primary and secondary prevention, while our social behavior change communication and public advocacy targets larger community. We also identify and target at-risk children and families with access to services and social protection. This is together with social and behavior change packages, including Safe Migration Toolkit, mapping and tracking at-risk children and adolescents, and monitoring hotspots of unsafe migration, such as railway stations and linkages to social protection and services, providing mental health and psychosocial support at the community level and capacity strengthening of frontline workers and the child protection workforce. Uh, to share an example with you, in a state of Bihar in the eastern part of India, UNICEF, along with district administration, has been reaching out to ensure that no child is forced to work, create child-friendly environments near work sites, and make access to basic entitlements for migrant children living with their parents. Several children have been rescued from a few districts, which has helped us to identify hotspots from where children were either trafficked or migrate for work. And based on this, we have done a vulnerability mapping so that families and children at risk can be identified. We have then worked with the village and child protection communities and the local self-government mechanisms to build their capacities on identification and prevention, from go going, prevention of children from going into the workforce. And so uh, we have also launched a communication campaign and had various person-to-person -person communi communication program to build awareness. Um, during the pandemic, we have also had volunteers supporting the children to catch up on their classes and learning. Simultaneously, those children who have been rescued and have come into the system are being tracked through the child labor tracking system so that their rehabilitation is ensured. We also work closely with law enforcement, not only for rescue, but also to monitor hotspots and pathways of unsafe migration and trafficking like railway stations and bus stops and others. This includes a railway protection force, railway child line, and there is an expected increase in numbers due to the loss of jobs as a result of the pandemic. Similarly, in three more states, we have strengthened village child protection committees and adolescent groups who are able to identify situations which may lead to child labor or trafficking. Our interventions focus on firstly system strengthening, where we enhance capacities of functionaries as we mentioned earlier. And then we also link these services with other services like health and nutrition, and we also focus on building emotional and psychological resilience of children and their families. In the area of prevention through community mobilization, awareness, social protection, and services, we help the local governance structures to understand their roles and responsibilities towards child protection, particularly for ensuring access to social protection. We strengthen capacities of district administration to facilitate the development and monitor of the multi-sectoral district plans. And we, like I mentioned earlier, we also have the monitoring of the hotspots through community groups, volunteers, NGOs, child line, et cetera. And lastly, and importantly, the importance of evidence and data. Uh, we look at rapid assessments on migrant labor, especially during the pandemic. We will hear more about the initiatives from the representatives of our implementing partners of ActionAid and Aided Action who we have with us. I would like to also now say that these are some of the strategies which you are seeing on the presentation, some of the areas of work that we have been doing. But first, we have a short film on our work at the community level, which we will share with you. And then we will get into the panel discussion with our colleagues here today. Thank you very much. Behera Dehi village is located in Nuapara district of Odisha. It is a small agrarian village consisting of 144 households with 50% of its inhabitants being interstate migrants. Men, women, children and adolescents migrate to northern and southern Indian cities to work in Bricklins. The local Anganwadi took the lead with the help of aid and action volunteers to carry out the participatory mapping in the village. The local Sarpanch ward members, parents, adolescents have participated to do the social mapping and identify the vulnerable children. 
This mapping will help the panchayat to create a database of migrants and other vulnerable children to address their issues. आमे पैसा छिनी करी सरदार पाखनो आमे भठा नै करी जाउति ब छ मन के आ एबे सुविधा हे गले हमर छ मन ने पाठ पढो के के आलोचना माध्यम रे आमे समस्त किशोरी बालिका माने अध्यक्ष जानि पारे न हटा जाइथिबा शिशु माने फेरी उपकुष्ट रो शिकार हो छैते सेहि परिस्थिति मान को आमे आईसीडीएस सर्विस रे शामिल करी पारे जेन माने भठा जाउ छ पिला माने से मान को लागि चिंता करी सुरक्षा thank you um a welcome to uh, mr daniel and uh, mr khalid choudhry from action aid and aid at action who are here today with me uh, my first question would be to mr daniel uh, unicef and aid at action have worked together with the government of orissa in three migration prone districts to develop a model of prevention of unsafe <coughs> migration and child labor by strengthening the government system and community participation using a child vulnerability analysis and planning can you share with us your experiencing of piloting this approach especially during the pandemic and what have been the results so far thank you bandana uh, and hi everyone uh, you have just uh, seen the film uh, which we have depicted how we are doing on the ground and these other villages are hugely affected uh, because of migration due uh, during the pandemic there was a national lockdown and large number of people big children have returned to these villages very huge number and what we are doing with uh, district administration here is four areas like we are doing the vulnerability assessment creating a database of migrant and other vulnerable children for uh, at the local governance level uh, then strengthening system uh, at the local governance level again at the micro level by identifying and implementation of child protection plans uh, and link social protection uh, migrant children are tracked i think that is one area that we are doing how the government can track migrant children they are protected they are reintegrated uh, and also like uh, last but not the least uh, uh, we are also working at the destination at the bricklins uh, and re, uh, towards reducing vulnerability of accompanying migrant children uh, through a collective kind of engagement what happened during uh, uh, the pandemic uh, this assessment actually helped uh, thousands of returning migrant workers those having families children infant to connect them with the government entitlement health support uh, services during and after covid uh, this quarantine system because all were, uh, I, there was confusion all around uh, but we could able to reach out to migrant children and family who could have a better quarantine services um, local government care workers now maintaining uh, migration register i think i could tell you around 261 locations uh, mostly in villages the database of migrant children uh, are maintained so you have a database generated for the local governance uh, uh, setup Uh, and and uh, there is a in reintegration initiative going on uh, in these villages uh, we are mostly supporting to strengthen the system at the panchayat level panchayat is the local governance unit uh, which uh, the lowest unit of governance in in our villages in facilitating and grounding child protection plan in association with the village level child protection committee the local bodies government frontline workers and community based organizations just to illustrate an example uh, the cbap the, the uh, child vulnerability assessment and planning uh, in one of the local governance area uh, which consisting of seven villages uh, we could able to identify around 296 seasonal migrant children which include school dropout adolescent and many of them are also child labor 
who, who migrate with the parents and go and work in Brooklyn. Uh, we have prepared the school retention plan and family strengthening program uh, to retain the children back so that uh, the, the village committees, the child protection committee, and the local bodies can work together with the government. Um, we are also reaching out to migrant children at the interstate destination, interstate destination. Some of our work in the Brooklyn's include mapping of migrant children, connect them with social protection, prevent from harmful, harmful practices, create access to education, nutrition, health, and safe space for children at the work site. This particular work we are doing uh, in very close uh, partnership with also the, the government and also the Brooklyn owners. We're educating them how to create a safe space for children. Uh, thank you, Bandana. I think uh, uh, yeah, over to thank you. Now. you. Thanks, thanks. Uh, my next question is, is to Mr. Khalid. Uh, UNICEF and ActionAid have been working in the state states of West Bengal and Bihar to prevent child labor and unsafe migration. We have also developed a toolkit for the same, which has been widely piloted in a state. Can you tell us a little more of how we have approached the issue of engaging the community and the local leaders to reach out to the most vulnerable children, especially during the pandemic, and what have been the results so far? Yeah, thank you, Vandana, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, the, together with UNICEF, we have been <clears throat> closely working with gov government department on the issue to address the issue of child labor and uh, save unsafe migration in the state of West Bengal and Bihar. We are basically reaching out to most marginalized communities, particularly Dalits, tribals, OBCs, and uh, trying to strengthen the protection mechanism at local level, block level, and district level, and state level. In West Bengal, we have basically developed a communication package on prevention and addressing child labor that is being basically extensively used to reach out the vulnerable communities. And we have reached out more than 300,000 people and, and parents and children. Our volunteers, uh, trained volunteers and child protection committees, uh, PRI members and <clears throat> other community leaders are basically identifying child labor and uh, mainstreaming them in education and providing psychosocial care support uh, and counseling and ensuring that all these children, whoever are identified and mainstream, should retain in the schools and providing and linking with various social protection mechanisms available in the government. Yeah, as Mandana mentioned, we have also developed a toolkit uh, for safeguarding our children uh, in West Bengal. Basically, that actions for promoting child and adolescent protection in the construction, uh, context of migration. This includes a guideline and seven handouts for children and adolescents addressing their mental health issues during a moment and handouts for PRI members and community members, SHGs and village level uh, child protection committee members and frontline workers. Basically that highlights the role uh, in making, make the moment of children safe. Uh, the, the document was jointly developed by Panjaiti Raj Department and Rural Development Department and Department of Women and Child Development uh, officials. Uh, we have also captured uh, case stories basically to understand the nuances and experience faced by the children and adolescent at various phases of their journey while moving out for work. Uh, we have been basically uh, Panchayati Raj Department and DWCD's ownership of toolkits help to institutionalize it through uh, Gram Panchayat level development plan process at state level, district level, and block level, and gram panchayat level as well. That includes basically various actions to be taken up uh, in at, at the gram panchayat level uh, to basically incorporate their plan and uh, adolescent groups um, <clears throat> for, for the betterment of adolescent group. That basically this action will reach out around 50 lakhs of children and adolescent girls uh, through the actions uh, of the government uh, in West Bengal. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Khalid. My next question is to Mr. Daniel. Uh, if very briefly, actually we're running out of time, so I will ask both the panelists to just keep it to a minute, is maybe you can just highlight a couple of challenges you faced and a couple of recommendations very quickly. Can't hear you. 
You're on mute. Uh, yeah. Uh, working with migrant worker uh, is a lot of challenges uh, because they're not enumerated, they're undocumented, they're moving uh, uh, with their family, and they're particularly invisible. I think that that is the database of migrant children is a major issue. Uh, and we, India needs a portability of basic services for migrants who are actually moving within India. Uh, it's an internal migration when we're talking about. Uh, and third, all these uh, village institutions uh, working for the protection of children, they need to be equipped, they need to be strengthened. A uh, lot of such institutions are there so that children are tracked, they are reintegrated. Uh, implementation of child labor law uh, and also identifying child labor is a major issue that uh, we, are, we are also finding. Now, after pandemic, uh, we have seasonal hostels here and a wonderful seasonal hostel uh, being done by, uh, run by government where parents, they leave their children back in the, in the seasonal hostel. But last two years, the schools are closed uh, and the seasonal hostels are so closed. In, our, in one of our study, we could able to show that large number of children uh, have, have migrated with their parents. And this year we anticipate much more migration of children because the schools are closed, the hostels are closed. Uh, lastly, I would say that the, the multi-stakeholders partnership is very important. Uh, to work at the destination level with the industries, with the government, and also with, with the community. I think these are uh, some of the issues that I see as major, major challenges. Vandana? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, Mr. Khalid, uh, what are the major challenges that you faced, uh, if you could also keep it brief, and a couple of recommendations that you would say for the government? Thank you. Yeah, uh, particularly during COVID uh, restrictions and due to COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, that was a major challenge. Basically, it was difficult to meet people physically or organize meeting with government officials and communities. Uh, it was quite difficult. So largely, we were doing all the meetings and trainings online. There was some limitations. So that was, I think, major challenge. The second challenge we faced basically coordination among the various departments and bring all these departments together on the same page. That was a major challenge because it was a new tool and it took time to basically convince them, uh, convince government department uh, to institutionalize the overall mechanism, it, 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 that there was delay in the uh, institutionalization mechanism. So that these were the major challenges we faced during this program. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, over back to you, Elena. Thanks, Emilia Vandana and Daniel and Mr. Khalid. It was really interesting to hear all of like, your work. I will now let the floor to um, Philip Wilkinson and his colleagues um, and partners who will talk to us about the three approaches uh, to address child labor, to prevent child labor in fragile contexts. So over to you, Philip. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, can we have the first slides, please? I'm not able to see any of the slides, so I'm not sure if we've got them up yet. No, uh, Catherine has just shared. Are they? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think the first slide was a Mentimeter. Okay, sorry, if we can come off the presentation, the Mentimeter link is already in the chat, Philip, so you can all um, actually click on the Mentimeter and you will be able to see a question. Uh, Catherine, do you think it's feasible to um, show the Mentimeter question as on, the, on our screen so that everybody can see it together with Philip? Thank you. Okay, there you so go, Philip. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so we thought we'd just kick off our session with a, a quick Mentimeter to get us all kind of thinking about um, the subject that we'll be talking about. So um, I invite you all to um, give us your uh, top three um, words that you think uh, best describe what worst forms of child labor mean to you. We'll see what we get. 
morally degrading, harmful to development, harmful forbidden work, the ones that affect more, morally degrading, dangerous, exploitation, exploitative. Harmful to development, yeah. Great, lots of answers here. Okay, that's really interesting. So exploitation, harmful to development and, and sort of dangerous, I think, are the kind of top ones there. So um, <clears throat> the ILO defines the worst forms of child labourers um, where children are being enslaved or separated from, the, from their families, exposed to hazardous um, work or um, left to defend for themselves, essentially. It includes all forms of slavery or, or um, slavery-like practices, such as trafficking of children, debt bondages, uh, serfdom, etc. Um, the use, procuring, or offering of a child for prostitution or for the production of pornography. Um, the use, procuring, or offering of a child for illicit, illicit activities, um, for example, drug trafficking, and any form of work which by its nature or circumstances um, is likely to harm the health and safety and morals of a child. So the next question, um, I invite you to... Uh, I just dropped it into the chat. Do you, you have? I can't see it. I think the question was um, an estimate of um, the number of children thought to be involved in child labour globally. It should be there. Elena, can you see it? I can still see first question. Okay, I'll, I'll drop it in again. Okay, let me try again. Mm. Yeah, tell us how many children globally are estimated to be in child labour. And then there's the link there. Can we see the answers? Yep, yeah, sure. go 160 million 160 very well informed audience here <laughs> yeah okay uh, yes it is in fact 160 million uh, thought to be in child labor and that's an increase of 8 million up from 152 um, at the 2016 estimates and 79 million um, are thought to be involved in hazardous work which is a sort of proxy indicator of the worst forms of child labor um, interestingly, the most forms of child labor, labor occur in, in the family context, um, with agriculture sector accounting large, for the largest share globally. Um, we also found in the latest data that boys are more at risk of child labor than girls, 11% um, versus 8%. But um, this could be uh, slightly misleading as it doesn't account for the full range of unpaid domestic work that children, uh, the girls specifically, are um, um, tasked with at the home. And this is, in fact, a key finding from our programme as well. Um, and the third and final question. Um, can you tell us which region bears the greatest burden of child labour? Asia and the Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, or Latin America and the Caribbean. <clears throat> okay, so this is interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, act it's actually Sub-Saharan Africa uh, ranks highest, um, both in terms of prevalence of child labor, where about one fifth of children are involved in child labor, and in terms of the absolute numbers as well, 86.6 million, that's according to the latest uh, UNICEF figures. Um, in fact, efforts to tackle child labour in sub-Saharan Africa have plateaued in the last few years, um, whereas in all other regions, the number and prevalence has slowly declined. Okay, so thanks for that. I hope that was just a little bit of a wake-up uh, quiz. Um, we can move on to the next slide, if that's okay. So I'll, I'll be, I just took a little bit longer than I expected, so I'll be a bit quick through these next 
this next slide. So just introducing our program, the Partnership Against Child Exploitation or PACE. Um, so we are a um, collaboration of private sector, academia, media development and civil society organisations. We're intentionally working in fragile states to tackle the worst forms of child labour. Um, and in addition to reducing prevalence, uh, um, uh, another major goal of the programme is to document what the effective approaches are. And that's what we're trying to um, achieve today and share some of that information. Um, we began implementing in 2019. Um, we're funded by the UK government's um, Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office. Yeah, you can just stay on that slide, please. Um, and there are six partners, um, including um, a private company called 58, Thompson Reuters Foundation, UN Global Compact UK, War Child um, UK, and the Child Protection and Care Learning Network at Columbia University, and the grant leaders, World Vision UK. We're implementing in three countries, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, and in Ethiopia. Um, the issue in the former two um, tends to be around artisanal mining um, for gold and um, other minerals, including um, tantalum. Uh, and in Ethiopia, it's primarily in agriculture, such as cattle herding and, and um, uh, farming for pulses, etc. cetera. Um, our programme is divided into sort of four pillars. Um, the, uh, the, 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 first, the first two are sort of to do with um, support supporting policymakers, law enforcement, and the wider justice se sector to prevent child labor and hold perpetrators accountable. Um, we're also working with the private sector to su map supply chains and strengthen due diligence. Um, and then um, we are also working with children to help them resist um, or strengthen their agency to resist exploitation. And then also working with children and their families to access suitable alternatives to worst forms of child labor. And it's those last two that we want to talk a little bit more about today. So since 2020, uh, PACE partner, the Care and Protection of Children um, Learning Network at Columbia University has followed the delivery of various pilot interventions implemented by other agencies in the consortium, namely World Vision and War Child. And we are going to introduce the results of those findings today. The objective is to offer insights and recommendations for implementers planning to deliver similar activities in programs designed to combat the worst forms of child labour. Uh, the, these specific initiatives were implemented in, in CAR and DRC, um, which present a range of context specific challenges to the implementation team. Um, just to very quickly introduce the interventions, uh, we have the school gardens, which um, aim to provide children in or at risk of uh, engaging in worst forms of child labour with free meals at school. Um, the school garden intervention recognises that a major barrier to children attending school is a family's inability to provide um, for their children's everyday meals. Uh, the second intervention that we're going to talk to you about is parenting interventions, and these are designed to provide parents with the skills and techniques necessary to foster a safe and healthy home environment that protects children and the well-being of their children. In the context of child labour, parenting sessions equip parents to affect families with stress management and positive parenting skills, as well as strategies to provide psychosocial support to their children. Uh, and then the third um, initiative is um, around reinforcing children's agency through youth-led um, advocacy. And this, um, you, can, you can just stay on the, the other side because uh, my colleagues are going to talk more into these um, different interventions one by one. Um, the, yeah, so the third and final is uh, youth-led advocacy and it draws on War Child, um, War Child UK's Voice More program model. Uh, which is a youth-led advocacy intervention that helps young adults amplify their own voices to challenge the policies, practices and attitudes that continue to infringe on their human rights and lead to their involvement in the worst forms of child labour. So I'm going to hand over to my colleagues now. Uh, I think it's Stefano who's going to kick off with the school garden interventions. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> right. Next slide. Well, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the school gardens intervention. Um, so 
basically, um, I'll be talking about the resources that we needed to implement it, um, the potential outcomes that were uh, highlighted by the learning brief, and um, some of the learnings that came out of this um, pilot activity, which is obviously just one of the several activities we are implementing under this project, but um, it is um, one of the three that have been uh, closely uh, studied uh, to draw um, learning because it was innovative and uh, it was considered a test activity. So um, the aim of the school gardens was obviously to provide uh, school meals or using school crops to pay for school fees for the most vulnerable children in the school. Um, so involved in this activity, we, we see children, the, their caregivers, adults from the community, as well as um, obviously teachers, uh, school directors, and um, church members and student delegates. Um, the resources, first of all, are motivated school and community um, availability and access to water and land, uh, as well as agricultural inputs, tools, seeds, fertilizers, and um, pest control uh, phytosanitary products. Um, in terms of the key staff involved in this activity, um, we obviously need a technical expert, so an agronomist, um, and then the, the backbone uh, that allows us to implement this activity uh, is are the school gardens committees, which represent, take care of the day-to-day -day management and coordinate all activities that are implemented under this uh, initiative. Finally, last but not least, we also obviously need a lot of extra workforce in specific moments of the agricultural cycle, like land preparation, the seeding, the sowing, and the uh, harvesting uh, time. Um, all of these actors uh, are um, obviously require technical support uh, from the agronomist, uh, which we have provided. Um, on agricultural techniques, gardens management, and how to use uh, fertilizers and phytosanitary product. Um, and um, collaborating together um, based on uh, the learning that we, we draw from, uh, from this activity, there are several potential positive outcomes. First of all, uh, establishing a garden, which is well-maintained, um, and which produces uh, both stable crops and vegetables. Um, we uh, achieved harvests um, of different degrees of productivity. Um, and then uh, these um, harvests, wherever the canteen was also available, uh, fed into the school meal systems. So these allowed um, school uh, committees to provide meals to children in school. In turn, these meant that um, where meals were provided, um, we facilitated better attendance uh, to school and fostered a better um, learning environment, which combined with parenting intervention and other interventions to improve schools, infrastructure, and uh, teachers' training um, enabled a better reintegration of children victims of child labor into schools. Uh, finally, um, there is a sort of sustainability aspect because crops are not fully used, but um, they can be saved for, for further agricultural cycles um, and sold on the local market to, to gain some income to make the system sustainable. Um, and that is why often this is referred to as sustainable school meal systems. Uh, which we adopted from more in a development context. Um, what have we learned out of this experience uh, over the last two years is that uh, it's very important to staff recruiting, uh, recruiting staff uh, early and you know, procure agricultural inputs as soon as possible. It's very important to manage community expectations uh, with early, clear, comprehensive information on how the activities will take place step by step. Um, aligning communities' expectations with what the project can provide, um, and also to ensure proper compensation that of the time people spend in, the, in collaborating to the activity and provide them with adequate training.
Um, another important aspect is uh, to clarify early on in the project roles and responsibilities of the school committees, uh, school directors, uh, and all the stakeholders involved uh, in, in the implementation of the activity. Um, finally, um, as mentioned for sustainability is extremely important to think about the longer term sustainability. So making sure that the right kind of crops are cultivated, the sufficient land is uh, accessed and cultivated under the activity, that the crops are properly selected to ensure maximum um, dietary diversity for school meals, but at the same time that um, they can also provide an income to make sure that the system is sustainable by selling the um, agricultural outputs on the local market. Um, in, in terms of the challenges uh, we face and what we learn is that uh, context um, affected um, the, the activity in terms of natural disasters, but also in terms of security, uh, in particular the theft of um, harvest, which we're not expecting at the beginning of the activity, but it is a major problem undermining the production. And um, we learned also that budgets should be flexible and include some contingency for unforeseen errors, uh, inflation in the prices of items uh, or goods that get damaged uh, while carrying out the activities. Um, and now I think we can move to the next slide and I'll leave uh, the word to uh, my colleague. Thanks, Stefano. Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce to you the parenting activity, the youth-led advocacy, and some transversal finding valid for all three approaches. So, um, why do we? Um, why are we interested in uh, parenting activities? It's it's proven that um, families and parents are key in protecting children from adverse health and mental health effects on worst form of child labor. So, how do you? what is it like a parenting activity it's it's an activity that considers that parenting is a skill that you can learn and maybe a, a set of techniques and tools that you could implement in your daily life and that help foster a healthy and safe environment for children so how do you carry a, a parenting activity you can either like take a small group of people and uh, train them on um, uh, on your curriculum from like uh, really in a kind of a coaching way or you can um, you know try to do a more large-scale mass sensitization um, that goes a bit less in there so both approaches were tried and had their pros and cons um, for both approaches you need to first do a community needs assessment and make sure you target community with the highest prevalence of worse of child labor then you need to develop a curriculum. I'm going to come back on that. Uh, select and train your facilitators and organize your training sessions. So what are you expecting when you run this activity? You're expecting to lead parents to a place where they can learn and understand about the importance of their parenting strategies on their children development and, and where they are equipped with this like skills and tool set that they can then uh, put in practice. So you want to influence the way parents relate to their children um, so that uh, they are more able to protect and withdraw children from the worst form of child labor. Um, so it's very interesting. There's some issues when you try to implement these activities that I'm gonna uh, uh, touch uh, about now. So, the first is that very often you have a very beautiful curriculum, like of very interesting uh, sessions, etc., that are developed in French or in English, and then you send it to your facilitators, and they have to, or to your local team, and then they kind of adapt it as it goes. No? so that's that's one of the like the thing that you have to really think about if you want to implement this kind of activity. It's not sufficient to have a beautiful curriculum. You really need to work with your local team to adapt it, translate it. And especially the key words might not have equivalent in Swahili or whatever the language is um, that they're gonna use in the facilitating training. So you need to help them come up with the proper translations of words like empathy or uh, that really uh, raise issue. It seems obvious, it's a very common problem. Um, there, there. You also have to realize that your population is um, might not be literate at all, um, or very like um, 
uh, in a very limited extent. So, so there need to be an adaptation of the training um, uh, techniques and um, and the support material you you produce to help this, uh, your beneficiaries, uh, you know, remember from one session to the other and uh, better memorize what you're teaching them. So you have to use visual or uh, support pictures, leaflets, etc., to make sure they can. Um, really learn. Uh, the other thing is that you need to pay attention when you run this kind of activity. Uh, what we observe is that very often women would come and maybe their, their husband were less interested or they would be uh, less maybe available for it. And then we realized that their participation might uh, had created some, um, you know, suspicions or tensions in the household. So it's, it's important to understand how the gender dynamics work in the, in the community where you're working and make sure that you understand and you take care of the way this gender dynamic might impact the results of your program. Um, so next useless advocacy program. Sorry, I'm rushing a little bit because I know we're late. Um, the, so what, is the, what are these programs? They are like training programs by which you, you bring a group of uh, young people uh, to a level where they're able to advocate, uh, develop messages, and voice them in, in their community so that they change, uh, they impulse change in their, in their community. Um, to, so what you expect to do when you, when you run this, uh, this program is to, you know, you expect to um, have... Um, uh, so, well, first you select your participants, you train them, you train them both on advocacy, on like speaking in public, developing messages, etc. Then you help them and you support them as they conduct their advocacy work um, up to a certain point where you consider the mission is, um, you know, attained and you close your program. So on the short term, what we observed already in the small, uh, like in the six months where we observed this activity, you, you see that your participants, they are really pleased to be part of a group and they might exhibit behavioral change linked to increased self-esteem, um, ability to speak up. Um, and, uh, and so there is, there is this like change that you observe in your beneficiaries. And then you see in their close relative and family and in the community next to them, um, a change of um, maybe the way uh, people look at them. Uh, so th that could be like an increased awareness uh, among parents and, and like on like what it is to be involved in the development of child labor. It could be also a change of the way people look at these children that usually are more marginal marginalized, etc. On the long term, uh, you, you would like to see this change um, in attitude toward children, the family, etc., uh, to be spread to the community, like really leading to destigmatization, and um, and you you expect to have youth that are empowered and able to communicate with adults or even to with like local leaders about issues uh, in community where they might not have heard previously. Um, so quickly on the challenges that you will face when you try to implement this kind of activity. Remember that we worked in fragile contexts. So, um, so again, here there's a literacy issue. If you want to bring these young children, like uh, these adolescents, to the point where they're able to write their own messages, develop them and advocate for them, you need to take into account that you will have to train them um, uh, in, in a specific way, because they have, they might not have been to school, they might not know how to read and write, etc. So this needs to be prepared and really um, supported. Uh, and then there is a huge safety issue. So when you, especially in some of the places where we work, children uh, are uh, involved in uh, armed groups. And so taking them out of the armed groups to help them uh, develop advocacy message against uh, enrollment of children, might put them at risk. Uh, you might, you know, oops, we overtime that, so I'm gonna rush. <laughs> Children may be at risk uh, if you confront them to their former employers. Um, of course, they might work in communities where norms might not support, um, you know, children to speak up. And, and also in this context that are very unstable, um, the safe involvement of local authority may not always be possible. 
So, so before running this program and during uh, while this program is running, you have to uh, con consistently um, run risk assessments with these children and their community. Can I have one more minute for transversal finding? Yes, Cecile, please yeah. to give us um, a few infos on your transversal funding and then we'll move on. Thank you. Sorry for the for the delay. So there's uh, two kinds of transversal finding I wanted to convey. So one, Stefano touched on it a little bit, so I'm going to be very quick, but we are working in fragile context, which means that these are low resource setting, like it takes time to recruit people, it takes time for any procurement that you might well, you need to anticipate. And these are low infrastructure settings. So when two of these programs were based on the idea that you would gather people and train them, etc., we ended up in places where there were no space to gather, no room. And we ended up in one of the fields to have to build um, the space in which we could then gather people. Uh, there's a lot of unexpected events. And you need, especially again, if you're in a training uh, program, you need to always uh, ensure the continuity of your program among all these interruptions that you are due to unexpected, like um, disaster or like displacement of population, etc. So uh, you need to be very flexible, adapted. Um, and then there is a, it's a rural setting with an agricultural calendar. And so that might undermine children and caregiver availability. Which leads me to my last and most important point is that when you are running a program against uh, the worst of child labor, you need to be aware of the disruption that your program might create in the economies of this family. So basically, your program has an opportunity cost. You take people out of the work to, to participate in your program. When they're there, they don't do something else that usually they do to put you know, food on the table externally. So you need to um, first try to accommodate your program schedule to the work schedule uh, when it comes to parents, for example. Uh, and when it comes to children involved in worse of child labor, you need to provide alternative compensation and support if you're removing them for their source of income. Um, you need to help them explore referral signposting options if uh, they're engaged in worse of child labor and want to leave uh, because of your program. Or, or you could implement these interventions alongside other complementary programs. But this is really a major, very important point that um, will um, really put your project success at risk if you don't think about it ahead. Thank you for your attention and sorry for having been a bit over time. Merci, Cecile. Thank you, Philip. Grazie, Stefano. Uh, what a mixed group in terms of background. Uh, very interesting. I think we have eaten a little bit of the time that we had available, but we're there. So we'll just give like a two minutes break. It's super short. You can go off video, grab a glass of water, grab a coffee. Um, you know, we'll be right here. You don't need to close your link. Just stay where you are. Just maybe go off video and mute yourself. And we'll be right back at uh, 57 past, according to my clock. And we're back. I hope you stretched your legs, moved around the room a little bit, like it gets... Um, tiring when we're sitting for a while so it's good to move around get a bit of water freshen up like be nice and lively back on time as you are and now I am gonna leave the floor to Mike Kira Kostian and Sarah Gazarian who's gonna be talking to us like about an initiative on utilizing research to build preventative preventive programming so over to you, Mike. Thank you so much, Elena, and thank you everyone for being here and having us present. Uh, so uh, as Elena presented, um, I'm Mike Kirakosian. I'm the Child Protection Specialist working with World Vision Lebanon, and I have my colleague with me, Sarah Gazarian. She's a research uh, analyst with us in World Vision Lebanon. Um, can we please share the slides? Thank you. I want you to imagine yourself in your car, stuck in traffic. The sun is scorching hot 
and you're just there in line. You're waiting for it to move, to get on with your life. An eight-year-old girl approaches your car. With her sparkly eyes and lively smile, she asks you for some water. You tell her that you don't have any. She looks like she's selling something, yet she doesn't make an offer. She asks again for water, but this time she points to the bottle on the floor under the seat. You realize that, yeah, there is a bottle of water there. And as you reach down to fetch it, the girl snatches the bag from the back of your seat and runs. How does this make you feel? How would you react in such a situation? Would you become perhaps angry? Would you say bad words? Would you shout or maybe run after her? Children on the street, whether selling items or begging, go through similar dangerous experiences very often. They are not only being robbed of their childhood, rights to education and protection and as such, yet on top of being exploited by adults who should be protecting them in the first place, children are also subjected to stereotyping, labeling, discrimination, exclusion, threats, and public humiliation. The brief story I shared with you just now is a real life example out of so many stories shared by children. Yet this one was not shared by, to us by a child. A person posted this on social media with a picture of the face of, of the girl. As a warning for whomever is passing by, the person called the girl, and I quote with reservation, the little thief. Some people left horrible comments on social media. One of them was so horrible and unimaginable to the point where I spent some time thinking if I can ever mention it here while telling you the story. And I decided that I couldn't. Why would parents send their children to work in horrible conditions? What would drive those behaviors in parents? Aren't they supposed to protect their children in a nurturing environment? What would make them take such harmful decisions that negatively affect their children's lives? Those are some questions which this research aimed to answer. Child labor is a widespread and growing phenomenon in many developing countries. An exacerbation in its figures is expected to rise, especially with the economic repercussions of the pandemic, which highlighted poverty. Engagement of children in economic activities is a complex interaction of social, cultural, and economic factors. And World Vision has strong evidence on how to reduce child labor rates and prevent harm to children. It is worth mentioning that school attendance in the literature is the only alternative to work. More than 50% of Syrian refugee children were reported as not enrolled in formal education, according to the US, US Department of Labor in 2020. And recently available data on refugee population highlighted the number of children aged five and two seventeen who are engaged in child labor almost doubled since 2019, reaching 4.4% in 2020. I give the floor now to my colleague, Sara. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and good day, everyone. So I'll start with the research aim and the objectives. The aim of the research study was to explore figures around child activity options, be it school enrollment and child labor, including household chores, and their determinants for, age, for children aged three to 18 years old in Lebanon, with a focus on the most vulnerable of them. Additionally, the study sought to determine the perceptions of child education and labor among parents of school aged children. The methodology, in terms of the design, the study was a cross-sectional observational survey of parents of school-aged children in Lebanon. The participants, that is the parents, were both of Lebanese and Syrian nationalities. So the target population was caregivers of school-aged children among the most vulnerable 
residing in different, different areas in Lebanon. The total required sample size was 769 participants and the targeted respondents were equally split between males and females. So now before we continue, I'd like to ask um, everyone here a small question. What do you think are the determinants or the drivers of child labor on a household level? A link uh, should be showing in the chat box so that you can drop your answers. I can see poverty, lack of awareness, economic factors, social factors, with much of the answers having poverty in there. See? So, yeah, I can see much of answers around poverty and some around social norms. So indeed, economic situation does play a big role. However, there are other contributors as well that push um, parents to drive their children into child labor. Um, let's move in with the slides and see what are some of the findings from the research tell us. The findings revealed that the worsened economic situation was the prime motive behind uh, the withdrawals from school. When exploring the reasons for withdrawing children from school, 75% of the parents stated inability to pay school fees and expenses as the prime reason. And uh, here it's worth to mention that school withdrawals can be translated into several risks, like falling into child labor, having no form of meaningful activity, and gaining no skills to build a future. In terms of child labor, the findings revealed that 5.4% of the households with children three to 11 years old reported having at least one child involved in child labor. When scrutinizing the profiles of these households where at least one child is involved in labor, almost half, 45.6% of the children in the household are involved in child labor. Engagement of at least one child in child labor was higher for the, or, for the older age group of children, 12 to 18 years old, compared to the younger mentioned uh, a while ago, three to 11 years old, where the findings revealed that 12.7% of the households with children, 12 to 18 years old, reported having at least one child involved in child labor. And while examining these households, we can see that uh, 68.8 percent of the children within these households are involved in child labor. When disaggregating by nationality, since the study sought to uh, look at figures for both nationalities, Lebanese and Syrian, we can see that two percent of the Lebanese households reported having at least one child, 12 to 18 years old, involved in child labor. While this was uh, reported by 19% of the Syrian households, this hints that child labor is a more common practice among the Syrian cohort. The same pattern was observed for the younger age group. Next slide, please. For the younger age group of three to 11 years old, where 5% of the children in the Syrian households uh, were reported to be involved in child labor, while none was reported in the Lebanese subpopulation. Uh, it's important here to mention before I leave the floor again to my colleague Mike that when studying the predictors of child labor, parental, perception, parental perceptions were predictors of child labor in the younger Syrian age group. The predictors for the older age group were sociodemographics, and school involvement in the Lebanese cohort, while they were predominantly, again, perceptions in the Syrian cohort. It's noteworthy here that a significant greater engagement of boys in child labor was observed compared to girls. 
further dissociation of child labor involvement with monthly income and perceived financial status in the Syrian cohort raised red flags. And this is because higher involvement was observed in the middle income categories compared to the lower income categories. And for those reporting that some of their needs were met compared to those who had most of their needs met. This again highlights the underlying factors contributing to child labor aside from the purely financial factors. Uh, I'll give back the floor again to my colleague, Mike, to continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir, for uh, presenting the findings. Uh, we're we're going to move now to the parental perceptions out of this same research, and I'm going to just jump right into them. So out of this research, we found that 44% uh, think involving children in a paid job enhances their life skills, and 46% think that peer pressure increases the number of children involved in child labor. Next slide, please. 14.5% of uh, caregivers said that child labor is an accepted and common form of practice. And 35, approximately 35% approximately uh, of caregivers think it is acceptable uh, when the child is above the age of 14. Next slide, please. Thirty-seven percent of care caregivers said that cultural beliefs increase the numbers of children involved in child labor, and thirty-four point eight percent think the working child makes a responsible adult. Going through the uh, two main takeaways of this research, education and child labor outcomes are non-binary. We found around approximately 20% of households with idle children. So they're not involved in any type of work and they're not in enrolled in any form of education. Another takeaway would be that perceptions surrounding school enrollment and child labor were more pro prominent predictors for the outcomes uh, and played a bigger role for the Syrian refugee population than the Lebanese. Despite the dire economic situation, having 80.7% of respondents earning around $57 now uh, as a monthly income uh, compared to how, how much the devalued uh, lira, uh, or if we can compare it two years before, it was around 666,000, uh, sorry, $666. Uh, standalone livelihoods and cash interventions are not enough to to tackle the complex issues of child labor and school dropout. As perceptions related to child labor and education play an important role in the decision, specifically in the light of if the deteriorating yes. economic situation, high focus on livelihood that should not come at the expense of not working children, as the number of children out of school or in child labor are continuously increasing. And we've seen reports saying that Almost 400 children in Lebanon currently are out of school. We need to assess the risks, the push and pull factors whenever we're planning to include a cash component in child labor projects, as this research has shown that still, when caregivers reported most of the needs were met, that they had higher rates of children involved in child labor, especially in household chores for girls than caregivers who reported that some of their needs are met. We need to, uh, uh, no, just before the what's next, uh, there's a couple of points. Additional uh, recommendations would be to integrate child protection more into education. We have seen a lot of advancement in this area, but we still need a lot of uh, a closer look on how to make sure that this is sustainable. We need to provide caregivers programming and parenting tailored to their gender needs and also cultural needs. We need to uh, identify the perceptions and the risks, uh, the risky drivers that are driving new children to join uh, the workforce. We need to tailor programming, as I said, uh, taking into uh, account a gender uh, and inclusive lens. Continue 
strengthening and investing in early childhood education programming as this can curb the, uh, the curve uh, on the longer run. Next, next slide, please. Thanks. So what's next? World Vision Lebanon uh, is conducting a barrier analysis to uh, identify doers and non-doers uh, of the behavior preventing children from being involved in child labor and retaining them in education to map behavioral pathways. Specific determinants are being assessed for risk levels, example, perceptions of susceptibility and perceptions of social accept acceptance and so on. Those determinants identified as barriers will be addressed through embedded preventive programming with caregivers to influence change in behaviors and social norms. Thank you, and this is all from my side. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, that was a super interesting presentation. And I think there is um, a question in the chat, which I'm going to post directly uh, to you because it refers to this research and it's from Nada who asks, can you share the research, the research or this presentation with us, please? So is it publicly available, Mike? Yes, it is available, but I don't know why I cannot share the, the hyperlink in the chat, but of course, uh, uh, I can share it here just a moment. Yeah, take your time. Then um, I'll stay on this presentation because there is another question that was directed to Sara, and then I'll pick up on a previous question. And the uh, I cannot read the name, unfortunately. I apologize because I think it has some uh, um, capitals which I can't read all together. But the question is, what was the indicator? Uh, and did you look at the age group between 5 and 17? Sarah, I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Oh, sure. I'm not sure I understand uh, the part where um it's being referred to the indicator. So I'd appreciate if the person who asked the question uh, can re-ask the question. But about the age groups, I can say that we looked at two age groups. The bigger age group, the whole age group covered was parents of children three to 18 years old. Then we divided this big age group into two smaller ones, three to 11 years old and 12 to 18 years old. Wonderful, Sarah. And then thank you both, Mike and Sarah, for your presentations and for picking up on these questions. If you have additional questions, please like do drop them in the chat. There is one question, which I think it's on school gardens. And I think it's for Stefano. Uh, is Eshani Ruampura, who asks, I have a question for the school garden program. In fragile context where the needs of families can be so very basic and dire, security, food, health, how open are parents to following positive parenting, parenting skills programs? Do they see this as a priority? What do they see as the benefit of these programs? Were these questions explored in the intervention? I don't know if it's Stefano or Cecile. Maybe it's me. Go uh, ahead. About <laughs> uh, but Stefano, uh, you can uh, complete my answer if you want. Um, so um, a large share of these uh, parenting uh, interventions are consistent, consistent training on how to um, understand your emotions, understand where your stress comes from, and express uh, better what you're going through, and understand how like everybody in the family is feeling, etc. So in fact, um, we 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 had so it was very longitudinal study where we uh, very regularly um, interview participants on how they feel about the program, etc. And so while some of the sessions remain a bit obscure, like session around you know brain development of a child. Uh, for example, some, so these ones around like handling emotions, handling stress, uh, expressing what you go through, etc., were very, very valued by uh, the participant. And they felt like um, it was really giving them tools to feel more at peace and being more able to uh, debunk uh, tensions in their own family. So because this program are really tailored for this uh, context where 
for example, like they take very practical example of um, if uh, you know you're having a fight with your neighbor, your husband, etc. How do you handle it, etc. So um, uh, it was actually uh, quite a successful program in, in the sense that it raised a lot of interest from the participants. Um, so yes, it was explored and um, they, they did see it as an important thing. Again, in terms of priority, uh, as, I, as I said at the end of the presentation, it's important to really pay attention to when you're doing. So for example, at first, you know, they would do it on Tuesday afternoon because that's when uh, the staff member were working. And then they realized that uh, parents were not available on that day. So they ended up agreeing with the parents that they would come on Saturday afternoon or Sunday, etc. Uh, because this was the moment where they would really take a time off to, to participate. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Cecile. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I'll take the freedom <laughs> like to ask myself a question. Um, some concluded thoughts, like on preventing child labor, um, that you would like to make, uh, and that maybe didn't come up, like in the, the presentations that you have just given. Um, so. Your recommendations in terms of like, pre the work that you're doing on preventing child labor. Um, Mike, would you like to give us a start? Sorry, I'm putting you under the spotlight. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Thank you, Elena. So honestly, uh, uh, first, Thank you, everyone, and I would like to thank the presenters for for really um, a variety and in, in, in the work and, and everything you're doing to make sure that children are protected, and ensuring um, the key to uh, to programming pre good preventive work for children involved in child labor and its worst forms uh, are caregivers. And I guess uh, throughout. Uh, all three presentations, uh, there were there were emphasis on the importance of involving caregivers and parents in uh, uh, programming, whether that's uh, positive parenting or any type of uh, uh, parenting support programs involving adolescents in the community and advocacy work that needs to be done to uh, be able to tailor and voice out their concerns re related to their rights. And that's very important, especially in contexts where there are uh, children in involved in worst forms of child labor or in uh, including uh, uh, children infected in armed forces and groups. Uh, in Lebanon, this is uh, the, this last topic um, is a bit of a taboo to talk about. And uh, we have not, uh, we are only currently seeing a, uh, uh, developments uh, in that area uh, and we are also seeing um, trafficking in persons uh, programming only just kicking off which include of course uh, 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 working with children and their family households I think the complement the complementary work that needs to happen is also on policy level and, and to not just um, uh, to shift or change policy, but also to see that those changes take effective, uh, 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 become impactful and effective, and we see them on the ground. And those should be always highlighted by what children uh, uh, say and, and what they think is right for them, not for us as organizations or civil society as a standalone or as a parachuting programming on them. And I think in the three presentations, we have a good, very good examples of how we start bottom up with the programming and with really um, uh, taking into consideration the voices of the people and the children to uh, build those programs. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, very interesting and um, same question to Philip your concluding thoughts recommendation on preventing child labor thank you um, so there's so much that we could obviously go into it's very difficult to sort of um, give one or two sort of um, uh, you know kind of parting words really but um, I think one thing that I've really it's really stuck out for me um, 
from working where we're working, which is in, in these really most fragile contexts, and where we're looking at um, worse forms of child labour, I think um, we need to be conscious of the reality of these children and the families that they're working it that, that we're working with. They they do need to work. You know, they their um, their future um, it looks very different to to others. Um, you know, in, in different parts of the world. So. To have this sort of hard line, children should not work, is 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 not going to be a sustainable um, approach. Perhaps one day in the future it might be, but right now it's not. So we need to look at what, how can they continue to earn money, but in a safe way, uh, in a way that doesn't interfere with their education or doesn't put them at, um, you know, in that most extreme category. I think that would be one um, one factor, um, and. Um, uh, I did have another point and I've forgotten it. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's that's I think a key a key recommendation that we can make from 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 the PACE program. Yeah. Thanks, Philip. Very interesting. And mm. lastly, from amongst the UNICEF partner, a question for Daniel. Um, any recommendations, final, final recommendations you would like to make on uh, ground actions, like to prevent child, ground level actions to prevent child labor? Thank you, uh, uh, Lina. The issue is like, uh, migration, trafficking, and the child labor in the entire value chain is now quite visible. Uh, and it's a very complex issue. So basically like how to prevent them from the villages and, and linking them with education and social protection is the key. Uh, that is what, and, and uh, uh, the migration is going to increase. That is what has been after the pandemic, more children may join the labor force. So it's a, it's a huge challenge for us. Uh, because the pandemic is uh, is also uh, uh, like you know uh, forcing families uh, into poverty, and then I think these are the challenges. How governments can actually come up with plans to prevent such migration, distress migration, distress condition leading to child labor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thanks to all of the presenters today and to all of the participants that joined like for this uh, chat about preventing child labor. A couple of notifications. <laughs> so you're all very welcome to join the full annual meeting day starting again at um, 13, 15 Central European time with sometimes in plenary to chat, to network, to get to know each other before we uh, dive again into other thematic sessions. And obviously the annual meeting continues today and in the next uh, few days. So uh, make sure you consult the agenda and pick um, what you like the most. Um, Okay, sorry, Mike has raised his hand. And then before, I'll just make a last notification. There is gonna be a survey that we're gonna drop in the chat real uh, shortly. And that's for you uh, to, um, to keep in mind, uh, sorry, to feel so that you express like your thoughts on how the annual meeting has been going so far. And it has been a real pleasure to be here with you, Mike. I think you have like your end up, like go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. I just want to make sure that uh, uh, there are two points that I fear uh, I haven't highlighted. And those are very important points. The first one is uh, we ask donors to, especially in Lebanon and maybe in the region, to make sure that they fund longer term programs to see social and behavior change really happening. We have experience that with shorter programs in humanitarian context, it, it will not be impactful as much as having longer term programs including multi-sectoral approach, so having child protection, education, livelihood included in those programs. That's my only point. I just want to raise the voice on this one. Thank you so much. Heard. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. So the link to the survey is now in the chat. Like, do take five minutes to please fill it. It's very important for us. So, like to hear from you and join us again later today uh, for the other annual meeting sessions. Uh, thanks again to the amazing presenters today and to all of the amazing participants. Have a lovely day. <laughs>